So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. So uh, my name is Bayer Sahan. So I work in National Museum of Mongolia for archaeology. So I spend a lot of time for Bronze Age archaeology with Bill in Northern Mongolia. So and this time I'm going to present about uh, both light and dark side of the Mongolian heritage. So how the, the looting is, in fact, you know, the destroying our past history and our cultural heritage. So, so uh, Darhad Valley is uh, uh, the, you know, the well-known uh, the area for our, you know, the early research for the Bronze Age and their stones, Herrick source. We spent almost 10 years there with Bill for their stone studies. So, and later, uh, you know, uh, we worked between 2003 until 2010. So, and after a few years, we uh, be back to the, you know, the Darhad Valley. It's uh, in the early, you know, the early research time. There was there wasn't a lot of looting in that area. But after 2010, when we back to this back to the valley, that every mound is destroyed, even Bronze Age, medieval, or Turkic. It doesn't matter. It's like just mounds are destroyed and looted. So uh, then we decided to, you know, salvage some uh, Bronze Age sites in the valley in the open valley, in the Hutt Valley. So this all markers are uh, the research area we work with and we survey, uh, we did survey. So it's most of them destroyed, looted, like hundreds of them. You know, it's Bronze Age Herxurs, just big hole in the middle. So human bones everywhere, animal bones everywhere. It's like the huge problem in, you know, the looting in Mongolia these days. So it's, it's like more uh, uh, reason is, uh, economic, no education about cultural heritage, and also the ninja miners, which is uh, the illegal miners who, you know, travel everywhere in Mongolia. They have the metal detector and then, you know, they check every, you know, the grave and if there are some signals, just destroy and loot and then go. So uh, I think it's, this looting is uh, very closely related with uh, the the big mining fever in uh, 2000, you know, the 2013, 14 in the, the Taiga. So there's hundreds of, you know, the illegal miners went up to the Taiga. You know, the, between the Taiga and the sites is between the Taiga and along old town. So most of them saw these graves and everything. And they, you know, the, on their way, they try to, you know, the, find something, you know, the uh, gold or something from the graves. But uh, unfortunately, Bronze Age graves are, you know, the, not <laughs> not much things you know the finds you can be have you can't be have you can be have so and uh, so we decided just we can do just salvage work for the bronze age sites in the valley and suddenly we found the huge cemetery in the, on the the forest a mountain named Horuk. it's like uh, one local guy said oh there are so many the graves looted in on the mountain so you you want to see them? Oh, yes, of course. And we went up to the, this mountain, the big mountain, Horig Mountain, which is at the top of, you know, there's two cemeteries. Horig 1 is the this ridge of the mountain, and Horig 2 is the also this ridge of the forest mountain. So, and first year we discovered, you know, 2000, uh, 2017, we, uh, we just discovered this site, and most of them was this also destroyed, looted. So the every textile, every bone, everything is like iron objects is everywhere, just like garbage. So, and that year we didn't have the permission to work here. So, and the next year we asked the permission to work here, do more salvage work. So I'm the not person to, you know, to do the medieval archeology span in my early career. So, and so then ethically it's hard to leave them in like that way. So I want to work salvage. And so collect all the things and, you know, the archeological way. So then uh, uh, 2018, we uh, salvaged almost 26 graves in Horik one site in this ridge of the mountain. And then last summer, we salvaged almost 42 graves in this ridge. So almost more than 70 graves we salvaged. So it's like the burials destroyed by looters. It's some of them in the forest area, some of them is open, you know, the slope of the mountain, the ridge of the mountain. The current situation was like that. So human bones is already getting white. And so this looting was, you know, the 
a couple of years ago or several years ago, still organic materials survive on there on the ground. So it was wonderful preservation site because it's higher mountain, permafrost. So that's why this preserved all the organic materials preserved very well. And so uh, the, our salvage work is consisted by several steps. So first we did some, you know, the visible collect, you know, the finds on the surface outside of the pit, the looted pit. So then we can try to find the shape or the structure of the mound and measure, you know, the, how big or how tall is it. Then later we, you know, the, we can just, you know, the screen every the dirt we, you know, dug down. And then next level is the pit. So we need to, you know, screen or dig down. And also some graves are uh, survive something good, you know, the things able to know the structure of the grave. So, for example, this grave is, you know, the log coffin. Most of the grave was, I think, log coffin in it. So it's like buried in, uh, in the middle of the pit and then uh, supine graves and uh, the deceased head directed to the north and there is a small notch the north of the north of the you know the coffin put some interesting offerings so this is the the all the stru the structure of the grave in all that medieval graves so we dated them in uh, in the Smithsonian Bill took several samples from the Horguan site it's like exactly 13th 14th century dated so some of them a little bit later so this is all the measurements from the the, the the burials we salvage it so depth is not not too deep it's very shallow it's one or one in one in 20 centimeter mostly it's like permafrost they get permafrost and stop it and put the coffin and and they made the burial so luckily the the looters didn't didn't find something you know that they leave something in the in the pit because it's the north of the grave they have in its secret notch you know Big, they put some big flat stone, you know, the block and, you know, the clothes in this, this part of the grave. We discovered several, you know, like almost 10 this kind of ceramics, medieval ceramics. So this was the ceramic with shartos. It's the cream, the yellow butter from uh, the, out of uh, the clotted cream from cow or sheep. So uh, it, when, I, when I see, you know, this, Ceramic, so I thought it's just nothing there, maybe some dirt or some animal bones in it. And then when I, you know, it's high mountain every day, you know, that we have to hike up to the mountain. And then also every night we have to, you know, the went down by foot. So we have to, you know, carry all things on the, on the you know, hand or something. There is no car, truck or car, you know, the way to go up to the mountain. So then it's like broken a little bit. And so when I, when we took down to the, the car stop and then I put it in car and then we went to the camp, you know, the, you know, suddenly then smelling, smelling that kertos. So I just, I just, just surprised. What the hell this is? Where's kertos? <laughs> then I, I, you know, the, saw the, saw the box and then so one part of the, you know, the ceramic was fell down and then kertos was behind that. And I, <laughs> oh God, how can it be like 700, 800 years shartos in, in the grave? It's like new. Then we, we found also three more ceramics with urum. It's clotted cream. So this is very famous ceramic in Yuan Dynasty time period. So we uh, sent some samples to the Max Planck Institution in Germany. So we, uh, we, saw, we got some... Uh, the protein or uh, the the composition of the, this uh, urum, so it was made made from cow and sheep and also goat, because most of Mongolians collect urum from different animals. You know that they usually put them together. So to, first we thought this is maybe the food offering, but it wasn't because there is weak, you know, the like in middle of the, this urum, so like lantern. So they they made the lantern in the in the you know the corner of the grave. And then, you know, they, they, they made light and then blocked the, you know, that part of the grave. So it's like exactly the very good example to, you know, to see the platstone, which is, you know, the block in the ceramics in the corner. 
So there is wick, where it, you know, the white wick is preserved in the middle of the Urum Mejharta, so it was lantern. So one is just uh, ceramic, mud ceramic. The three uh, other ceramics were uh, just, you know, the Chinese, the Yuan Dynasty time period ceramic. So we collected several hundreds of the objects, which is some of them is fraction, fragment, and the fragment of the rope, silk rope, and so silk materials and organic materials, horse harnesses. So this is the very, very interesting, uh, the object we discovered first time in Mong from the Mongolian grave. Because this kind of sun and moon, moon is usually discovered from the Shindu site. But after that, never find any other sites in other periods. So this is the first time we found exactly the same sun and moon found from the Mongolian grave. So we found golden sun and golden moon and also silver moon. So Shunnu, compared to the Shunnu uh, graves, it's usually they attach to the coffin wall, the head side of the coffin wall. So we don't know the uh, the, because it was you know, diluted, we just screened in the dirt and we don't, we don't have any clear context. But probably it was attached to the something hard because there is the nail holes in it. So probably it's the same, same tradition like Shunno. We thought maybe the silver round object may be cloud. I hope so, <laughs> but we don't know. So also very important thing we found from the Herg site is the written inscriptions on the some objects. Like this uh, small fragment of the silk is like Chinese Hanza. It's like mentioning about longevity in Chinese character. So the other one is Persian, Persian inscription on the gold object. Still, you know, we're trying to understand read this, uh, but it's eroded, the inscription is eroded very much, maybe some, you know, one of my friend who, is, you know, who uh, uh, speak, uh, reads in fashion and he thought maybe this is the word for Khan, like compared to the, this Ilhanat, you know, the coins. So probably this side of the inscription will be word Khan, but the other three sides, we don't know still. So I'm sending the photos in different experts who, you know, studies in Persian. So other thing we found is silk with Om, the Tibetan is Sanskrit inscription on the silk. This is still secret. We found small kind of the things uh, rolled by silk, like a Buddhist sutra. These days Mongolians use, but we we didn't open it. So still we talking, discussing about how to open it because it's very fragile. It's discussing about conservators these days. So. Maybe something book or something, different things maybe in this, this bag. So then today, just I want to talk about just uh, the mortuary tradition between uh, the direct link between Shunnu and Mongolus, based on the sun and moon and also lantern. There are so many lantern ceramics found from the Shunnu graves, exactly same position in the corner of the muse corner of the tomb and the north side of the royal tombs in Shunnu. For example, this lantern cup, lantern cup or lantern base is found from the Takelting Hotor Shunu, the royal grave, excavated by Nawan in 1990s. So, and Dordignars, Eastern Mongolia, also they found several of them, and they also found some oil from the residue, and they analyzed them. It was sheep tail oil in Shunu time, but Mongolian, there is Urum Shatas. So it's like exactly the same tradition they followed in medieval Mongolia's sun and moon. Also, it's really clear evidence, mortuary tradition and symbolism of the Mongols and Shinnu people. It's direct evidence. So there, we found so many gold, silvers, even you know, after looting, so from the screen. So another interesting object is this golden Buddha figure. It's like Buddhist figure, then many people say this is Buddha figure. I don't know much about the Buddhism, you know, like, but it's like earliest evidence of the Buddhism in that part of the, you know, 
country, even 13th century, Buddhism was there. It's like very interesting. Golden earring, golden uh, ring. This is the only one piece of the golden belt we discovered. That others, the looters took the other part of the this set of the belt. Maybe uh, you know if we dig this site without looting, we can be the world amazing medieval museum in Mongolia. But we already lost so much things. But even today we discovered you know a lot of interesting materials from out of the graves. Even the toothpaste, the bone toothpaste, the tooth, uh, the toothbrush, yes. It's like also first time from Mongolian, you know, the grave in toothpaste or some brush, uh, toothbrush, and beautiful bone artifacts with carvings, different carvings. So it's like all destroyed and damaged by the looters. This is the most amazing find we found this year, the golden silk. So this is only few example, you know, the like in America or Europe found this kind of silk. So this is first time also this kind of, it's like uh, <coughs> the silk from Persia or Europe in that time period. So there, you know, uh, after this presentation, the Dr. Caroline will talk about more uh, research about uh, the previous samples took from the Herc site about her analysis in Simpsonian. So hey, she's going to talk about more about silks, mm, golden silks. And so this time also we brought uh, several samples for uh, for Paula here. And so it's golden silk uh, samples. The it would be wonderful results. So that there are so much leather fragments and objects we found also beautifully made, decorated. Horse harnesses, bow and arrow, and arrow, arrow heads, and some scissors. So the, my conclusion is, uh, so from the all evidence listed above, so it's clear that the site is Horg. So I want to talk about a little bit about Horg name, because the name of the Horg is uh, mentioned in the historical book record from the uh, Rashid ad in Persian history, who wrote the book in the 13th century. So he wrote, there are the sacred Hurg cemetery in Mongolia, two Hurg sites. One is the Borhan Haldo mountain in eastern Mongolia. The other one is unknown, maybe somewhere in Mongolia. There is Borhan Haldo mountain keeps the Chinggisang and Tolu's descendants. So the Tsagada Zuchis, so descendants is different Hurg they make. So this site name is Hurg, but still we don't know exactly the what people were there. So it's like Darhad, it's very far north. And also there's a name of the Darhad people today. So in, in Inner Mongolia or in medieval time, usually they said that that Hurg is protected by Orenka people. Usually they call Darhan. Darhan means it's like the, the people who, you know, have so many, you know, the power or protect everything in the sacred symmetries. So the many ethnographers, ethnographers believe that Darhat name from the, the Bogdhan. Bogdhan gave them it's like this name. But we don't know the origin. Maybe the, related with Darhat, this Darhat, or I don't know. That's more the future, you know, future uh, research will be tell more about, about historical sources. So my conclusion, this, it's like, this is exactly the medieval grave royal grave, but this is not a common grave. Everything found is very valuable, very, very, you know, the, like, unique things. Even it's, like, looted. So uh, there are several different mountains also have similar symmetries, you know, next to the, these mountains. So we are heading to salvage more work there in this year. Next year, I don't know how many years I'm going to spend for salvaging and collecting these looted graves in that area. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Good question. Um, so as you said, the name itself is extremely suggestive of having such a graveyard, grave site. Um, but is this name, like, 
has this been known all along? Like, why didn't people come here to study? Yes, that's a really good question. Is even you know the like early time when Bill and me went to the that there's stone site, the very close of this mountain, the name it Hergingam. So Hergingam, their stone is. That time I didn't know you know I didn't know about Hergingam. Just it's like name of the place something and then it wasn't. So there was Hergin on the mountain. So we did so much survey in the in the lower valley. Never, you know, they went up to the mountain in our Bronze Age archaeologists. So in the in the, the in the valley, but yeah, it's still you know it's like Hargis name it maybe. It's, I asked it from the locals. They said, "Oh, Harg was Harg in early time. I don't know when the name you know originated." So. The historically, they call Harg this mountain many, many, you know, the generations. The other other mountain is named Angonol, but in modern modern map set Namtol. So it's they changed the name. But if you see, so the the old map is named Angonol. So also there are cemetery destroyed, looted, exactly the same. Yeah. During your work, you were mistaken as the rulers of the miners, right? And so, how would you, you know, report or educate the locals to let them know about your actual work? Mm -hmm. What is it good? What is it doing? Yes, that's really. Uh, uh, Buko also told about. He hired. Uh, you know, if you hire locals, it's. We hired in the first year a couple, you know, the three or five locals. And once we, you know, they started to see some gold, so we, we started to concern because they usually think, oh, there's gold everywhere in this cemetery, so we have to loot more, maybe find more. And when we, you know, the back to the city, so that's why I started to hire the locals. Usually they think it's like gold and everything, you know, the, like every grave has the gold. So then usually they talk much more, you know, the lying in the community. Oh, they found, you know, hundreds of gold from that mountain. So the, the rumor is really terrible in Mongolia. They talk to each other, so it's like lying. And for example, Bill and me, you know, they excavated three horse, horse heads from in Darkhad Valley in Tzatzten Hoshu site. One local came and saw us, and then next year he was talking to us. Oh, last year too, the foreigners came and they, they found the full of gold horse head from here. <laughs> so it's like, usually we, you know, they present uh, or introduce our work for the locals in a good way. Usually we brought, you know, they bring them into our camp and show that, that fractions of the irons and organic materials, how, you know, the important these things for the, our history and culture. So now it's like the com local community near the Herc site is like, they understood about the work we're doing there, so. Um, thank you so much about this, and thank you for the work you did. Can you go back to the slide that showed some uh, arrowheads? Yes. Okay, right oh, there. Okay. Down in the bottom left. Yeah. What period are those from? This is very typical arrowheads from Turkic to Mongolian. Time, you know, it's like very typical arrowheads in medieval Mongolia. Yeah, medieval. yeah, medieval. Yeah, yeah like I, you, you found yeah, one I in Alta. Yes, exactly yeah, exactly right. same. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi, just a quick question, mm -hmm. Myra. Um, in all the areas where you've even just looked, are there any graves at all that have not been looted, or is it every single? Some, grave? some not looted, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't start to, you know, the dig the. They're not looted ones because I focusing on more salvage work because organic materials is on the ground. It's like time is going, as the getting you know the the worst shape you know bad shape. Is there some way to protect those until you can get to them? Yes, you know when this summer we did some uh, press conference after you know the discovering these things. Then I asked it from the government or the some agencies. Please protect this site or Darhad Valley because this is very, very, you know, the 
valuable area with permafrost, which is keeping the you know the organic materials very good. So still you know didn't do anything about protection. So local governor, I said, please come and see. She never come, and so I I told the police in the and the local government they never show up, and so nobody caring. You know these things. It's very hard. Yes, yeah. uh, I have a question about this. Do you have uh, any hopes or crystal comment on this? So, this is very um, good evidence that there was the connection yes. of the linguists. Yes. But linguistically, people, scholars usually distinguish the two groups the Mongol speakers and the Turkic speakers, right? Yes. So, any comments on this? So what are we do in Turkey? So, uh, you know, there's big argument about mm -hmm. Shunnu people was Turkic people or. Mongolian, you know, the ancestors. So it's still big argument. So I think this is the very clear evidence how the Shundu people linked between medieval Mongolians. So it's very clear, you know, the most true tradition in symbolism. Shunnu is the first empire, and Mongolia is the medieval empire. Still, you know, the sun and moon, our symbolism, and, you know, the state symbolism. So it's like really good connection between modern Mongolian Shunnu and medieval Mongolians. So I guess I would just ask, do you think these are Mongolian graves? Yes, this is Mongolian grave, but uh, we we send all the the human remains for analyzing DNA and isotope and C14 date to the Max Planck Institution in Germany. So mm -hmm. they're gonna care about that in a couple of years. So it will be the really good, you know, the collection of the DNA Mongolia's in Northern Mongolia. So I hope this is Mongols. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have one other brief question, Bill. Um, just to comment about, you know, it's not only the gold uh, and the silver and those those fancy things that lures the, the looters and others. Uh, there was a book published with many of these fragments, uh, some almost gold garments, uh, published in a very glitzy publication. Uh, Officially, uh, and Vira has found pieces of the very same garments that were published. So there is big money involved in organics, even when they're partially uh, preserved and so forth. So it's, it, unfortunately, it's not just a matter of, of gold. People know very well now that there are, there are collectors around the world who are looking for almost anything that is unique, but particularly if it's scientifically important and, and so forth. And unfortunately, they don't care at all if it came from here or there or whatever. It's just an object that has value to a lot of people. And unfortunately, that's fueling a lot of this as well. Horgos Horgia had to not told us, but Katani we in Bolshik Tonson Basin, the better Tonson Bolshin there not shot, then the Dadney was on the day of St. Dadney, his town would be hit. Тэгээд тэрэндээс олдсон малын ясан дээр си 14 хийсэн чи яг Кетаны үе гэж гарсан энэ. Гэтэ энэ дор ном туулынхаа урд руу ганцхан юм том болж байсан бид. Тэгээд тэр болчноос гарсан материал зарим хувийн цогцлуулагч нарт байгаа юм шиг байгаа. Одоо дээл захгүй дээл нь одоо тэд нарт нэг хандсуун захтаага манай мүжиэд би яадрс. Ингээд одоо тэгээ яах юм мэдхээ байсан. Тиймэрхүү байдалтай. Тэгэхээр ер нь бол энэ томоохон хэмжээний тоноул явагдсан, хууль бус найма явагдсан. Би одоо энэ асуудлыг би зөндөө олон одоо тагнуулын байгууллагаас хавлаа бүхэл хүмүүс хэлсэн ганц ч одоо асуудал тавьж байгаа газар алга тий. Like start educating and engaging the public more effectively, mm -hmm. and um, because then if you become more of like a public figure, they'll recognize you when you go up, you know, uh, to the countryside. And if you have like maybe a little bit of a um, comic book for the kids, uh, education, yes, yes, yeah, you know, then people will trust you. Yeah, and if, if people are educated and informed, they will care, especially the youth. Yes. That's very good, you know, the way to educate the locals. We are we are focused on the kids, and local kids. So kids will be more, you know, the available to learn or educate by cultural heritage. 
Then adult people, because adults are just thinking about, you know, herders usually focus on some gold or daily life or something and so. And a couple of places uh, I tried to, you know, the like, uh, collect, you know, the like, the trying to organize big meeting, local meeting, explain, uh, you know, like archaeology work and how, for example, Julia and me did uh, some uh, training and SMS, uh, we did some project in next to the Hope School Lake in Hatral this, the last summer, and we invited all the locals, all the tourists who go in that area, so we explain how, you know, the archaeological work goes, uh, so not much locals come. 